Today, the most pressing problem of our time is the global climate crisis. You know, I have a 16-year-old son, and he asks me, and his entire generation is asking all of us, what are we doing? And a generation that hasn't done enough, especially when 25% of global carbon emissions comes from transportation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here so early. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to everybody here. You know, Lime operates in 120 cities all over the world, and an opportunity to talk to people, share what we're trying to do, share our vision, uh, and be in dialogue with our communities is always a great opportunity. I want to thank the family for hosting here. Um, I'm a veteran of a lot of startups, and I love spaces like this, uh, where people come together and try to do the impossible. So it's just a wonderful opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my talk today is really about le two things, leadership, I'm going to talk about Lime's business leadership, what we've been able to do. I'm incredibly proud of the work the teams have done across the world. But more importantly, I want to talk about why. Why do we do what we do? What are our principles? What motivates us? What guides us? What are our North Stars? And it's this idea of leading with principles. That's what I want to convey to you this morning. And I'm going to share three of our core principles in a series of stories later on. Talks probably 25 minutes or so, just to, to give a feel. I think it's only fitting to do this kind of talk in Paris because, in my opinion, Paris is exemplifying what leading with principles looks like on the major problem of our time, which is the global climate crisis. And what I see, at least, as an outsider is Mayor Hidalgo leading with principles. You know, leading with principles is not convenient, it is not easy. It has costs, it takes fortitude. And when I see her expanding bike lanes from 700 kilometers to 1400 kilometers, when I see the building of a 3000 square meter solar facility to power government buildings and schools, when I see urban forestry programs like around the Eiffel Tower, I think that's leading with principles. And so I just think it's a great backdrop to be in, to be talking about this concept of leading with principles and to share with you what some of Lyme's principles are. And so before I begin the substance of my talk, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a father of three children, uh, ages 16, 12, and 10. And for 25 years, I've been in Silicon Valley. Half my time as an entrepreneur and half my time as an investor. So the first company I started in the early 90s, I took public, and my second company I sold to Google in the early 2000s. And then while at Google, with a group of people, I helped to get Google Ventures off the ground, and we were investing a billion dollars a year in startups, both in Europe and in the United States. And my primary focus was transportation. The market's huge, the ability to impact people's daily lives is something I'm very passionate about. So, Essentially, between a great family, between a career in entrepreneurship and a career in investing, I had fundamentally a great life. Truthfully, an easy life. But in May of 2018, I made my second to last investment for Google Ventures into Lime. And from that point forward, I really could think of nothing else. Um, like many of you, I suspect, I personally feel like we're in this incredibly unique moment in history. There are these overwhelming challenges we face, some of them, such as this, a movement of two and a half billion people over the next 30 years into cities, this great push of urbanization, and all the commensurate problems that come with it. Problems of congestion, you know, if it's estimated that if the two and a half billion people that are moving into cities get around the way we do today, we will need an additional one billion cars. I don't think anybody actually wants that. Problems of local pollution and, of course, global climate change, and problems of social isolation, problems of loneliness, the lack of connection between people. It's what I loved about when there was a two-minute break for people to get to know one another. This is what makes cities rich as great places to live but I do think we have an epidemic of loneliness and an epidemic of social isolation. And in the span of all of these problems, it's easy to be pessimistic. But in my view, 
this also affords an incredible opportunity and what I actually feel is an obligation. And that is an obligation for rapid change. So cities change. They tend to change over very long periods of time, decades upon decades, even centuries. But there are moments in our history, and I'm going to take you through one of them, where change is rapid. And I think we're at a time today where rapid change it is what is needed in response to the kinds of crises that we have in our cities and around the world. And so it's that feeling of challenges that we face, but an opportunity and an obligation for rapid change that got me to dive back in with both feet and to join Lyme as its president. And so what I want to do is I want to give this talk really in two parts. The first part is I want to talk about the leadership of Lyme. I want to talk about what we've been able to achieve in a short period of time because I'm so proud of what we've been able to achieve and I'd like to share it. But most importantly, as I mentioned, I want to talk about what our principles are, about why we do what we do as a way of sharing what motivates us and what drives meaning and purpose for our work. I want to start the talk with two main emotions. The first is gratitude. Thanks. So before micromobility became front page news, before there was $2 billion in venture capital that was invested in this space, there were the pioneers. For the last 50 or more years, a group of people have worked tirelessly, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so, to change the nature of the conversation we are having about our cities and the role of cars in our cities. They've worked to add bike lanes, and they've worked to get people to consider alternatives to the status quo about the way we get around. And it's really on their shoulders that Lyme stands. And that first fundamental message is, while micromobility is something that is a new topic, the debates and discussions we are having are not. And so many people came before, and without them, Lyme would not be where it is. And it's to them that I say thank you. The second feeling that I have is this feeling of wonder. You know, with all the challenges we face as a global society, nonetheless, every single day when I wake up and talk about Lyme and go to work, I am reminded that the business that Lyme is in was completely impossible just 15 years ago. And I've been working long enough to recognize what, what that was like. So let me give you an example. Lyme is a company headquartered in San Francisco with hundreds of employees all around the world, including 70 in China, that make the closest thing to a flying carpet that the world has ever seen. And we're able to deliver that vehicle to cities all over the world. And then people use a supercomputer in their pocket to access it on a global communications infrastructure that we now take for granted to get rides on a shared, efficient, lower impact, electric vehicle for a cheap price. That whole chain was completely, if you just rewind the clock, 15 years, that whole chain was completely incomprehensible. And we just take it for granted today. And I'm amazed. That's the feeling of wonder that I'm filled with. And we did all of that chain in a little over 18 months. That's incredible to me how quickly change is happening. And so the reason that I'm going to now share with you some of the achievements that Lyme has made is because I want to give it as an example of the kind of rapid change that can happen. And if it can happen in a company, I believe it can happen in our cities. And I firmly believe that rapid change and, and principled leadership can mean that businesses can be a force for positive change in the world. All right, so let me tell you about Lime's leadership. We are the leading micromobility player by any metric that you look at. We've already done over 100 million rides, 22 million of them in France alone, 16 million of them in Paris specifically. We've saved over 40 million kilometers of car travel, and that's 9,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. We've gotten there faster than any company in history in terms of total number of rides. We're in 120 cities in 30 countries, and we have the biggest fleet. You know, Lime's fleet in a little over 18 months is bigger 
than the entire US public transportation system. Every train car, every subway car, every public bus, bigger than all of it. It's bigger than the fleets of FedEx, bigger than UPS, a hundred year old company, bigger than DHL. So we've started managing a fleet of that size over 20 months, incredible in my opinion. We're the most popular down and most downloaded app in micromobility. We're the number one brand of choice. And in our biggest market, Paris here, as I mentioned, we've done over 16 million trips. But more impressively to me, in a little over a year, we've achieved 1% mode share on our peak days. And to give you a feel for what that means, 1% mode share, it took bikes 25 years to increase 1% mode share. So people are shifting their behavior and shifting it rapidly. We're making money in the majority of markets that we operate in. And the reason that that is important is because I firmly believe that lasting change, durable change, comes not just from making a world-changing service, but from making a world-changing business. That is how you make change in the world. Businesses and industry can be a force for good if they're led with principle. All right, so to recap, we've done the most rides, done it the fastest, in the most cities, in the most countries with the biggest fleet while making money. And again, the whole point of how we've done it rapidly and why I say it is because it is about how we make maximum change in the world. Okay, I wanna shift now to our principles. Why do we do what we do? What are our North Stars? What gives us meaning and purpose? And what drives and motivates the company? I wanna tell three stories to illustrate the point. And I really hope my slides are formatted properly and we'll see what happens. Um, so story number one. The year is 2015, and the darling of the Consumer Electronics Show is this. You wanna know what this is? Show of hands. Okay, this is the IOHawk hoverboard, and it was the darling, as I said, of the Consumer Electronics Show. First thing, it was very expensive at $1,800, but what it didn't have in low price, it had in this. It was cool. For some reason, the most popular celebrities, rappers, and music artists of their time were all over social media posting of themselves riding this vehicle. It, the tastemakers were using it and they were making it incredibly cool. And in response to that, dozens of companies with names you've never heard of were started to make more of these vehicles. It's estimated that at its peak, there were 11,000 factories in China making these vehicles, 11,000. In fact, they sold two and a half million units in six months. So why on earth is this device in the dustbin of history? Why don't you hear about it anymore? Does anybody still, anybody ride one of these things today? Yeah, nobody. So why? Well, I'd argue it's two reasons. The first is it wasn't useful enough. It was fundamentally a toy. It was designed to relieve boredom. And so you can't sustain when, you, when they ran into this. This killed the entire industry. There were reports of over 50 battery fires in the first six months of hoverboards. And the US Consumer Product Safety Commission declared it an unsafe product. And in fact, if you look at the Google Trends search result, you can see evidence of this was a flash in the pan. And so what's the lesson? The lesson to me is that no matter how rapid the rise of a category, a safety issue and safety issues can humble you and wipe you out at any given time. And that's why principle one for us and North Star one for us is safety is always the priority. It has to be, even when it's not convenient, even when it's not easy, it has to be the primary priority. We have to hold ourselves accountable to very high quality hardware and educating riders. And those are the two things we are doing. We're establishing safety standards with standards bodies across the world for our mechanicals, our batteries, and safety standards for testing. And importantly, we got to remember that, how many of you have ridden scooters? Okay, so, but the vast majority of the world hasn't. And we have to remember that it's, we shouldn't expect them to know how to ride these vehicles and be safe. And so we've hosted hundreds of first ride academies to teach people how to ride these vehicles and we're committed to that kind of rider education. So principle one, 
is about safety. We have to lead with safety. All right, story number two. 120 years ago, cities all over the world were in crisis. And they were in a very particular kind of crisis. They were in a poop crisis, which sounds crazy in today's day and age, but let me explain. The primary mode of transportation in cities besides walking were horses. It was the way goods were transported, it's the way people got around, and horses are fantastic, extremely useful, but they have a big problem, and that is they provide and they make 50 pounds of waste every single day. 50 pounds of waste every single day. And articles were written all over the world about people's fears that they were literally going to be buried in shit. This was a fear that people had. Now the good news is Henry Ford came along and while he didn't invent the automobile, in 1908 he did perfect something very important with the introduction of the Model T. The Model T was incredibly valuable for three primary reasons. The first is it had utility. It could do more, it could do everything a horse could and more. Second, it did not produce the primary waste product that people were concerned about, obviously. Cars don't poop. The last is it was cheap. It was $360, which is the equivalent of $7,000 today. I don't think you can buy a brand new car for $7,000 today. So it was incredible value relative to its cost. So what was its impact? Four years after its introduction, there were more cars than horses in New York City. Four years. And nine years after its introduction, the last horse-drawn carriage, trolley, was taken out of New York City. Nine years, the city of New York was completely transformed from this. This is a streetscape in Manhattan in the early 1900s. The street was where people were. And in nine years after the introduction of the Model T, you set the preconditions for this, a city dominated by cars. My point here is that in less than a decade, you had incredibly rapid change from a crisis to a technological revolution to the rapid change required to respond. And that really, to me, is the lesson. The lesson is Whatever you are working on, it must absolutely address the most pressing problem of the time. The most pressing problem of that time in cities was waste. In that case, horse waste. Today, the most pressing problem of our time is the global climate crisis. You know, I have a 16-year-old son, and he asks me, and his entire generation is asking all of us, what are we doing? And a generation that hasn't done enough, especially when 25% of global carbon emissions comes from transportation. You have to work on the most important problems of our time. A study out of North Carolina was talking about what are the carbon emissions of a scooter. And what they found is that scooters emit half the carbon of a car. That's nowhere near good enough. You know, a scooter weighs 1 80th the weight of a car. We cannot be happy that it only emits one half the carbon of a car. Now the primary reasons that it only emits one half the carbon of a car and not less is two things. The first is scooters don't last long enough. Now at Lime, we're on our fifth generation of scooter and we're continuing to invest in making the hardware last longer and longer. Our current generation lasts well over a year. But the second problem is there's too much carbon in the process of redeploying and moving scooters around in a city. And we have to get better at those two things. We have to work on the most important problem of our time, which is climate. And so this is really our North Star number two. We have to be a meaningful part of the solution for carbon because transportation makes 25%, as I mentioned, of global carbon emissions. And to us, that's two things. We have to commit to 100% landfill diversion. Not a single scooter part, piece, or entirety can end up in a landfill. Today, in Paris, we're at 97% landfill diversion. That's pretty good. The last 3% is going to be the hardest. You know, there's a, how many people here are familiar with the idea of um, 
circular economy as opposed to linear economy. Great. I love this principle. You know, we get out of the take, make, and waste linear cycle, and we get into a circular economy where what we do is we view waste as a design problem. And that's the way we're approaching our future generations of our scooters. How do we, from the very beginning, design out waste so that we get to 100% landfill diversion? And the second thing we need to do is we have got to get to a completely carbon neutral footprint for 100% of our operations. Today, we, we've partnered for the last year with Planet We to do renewable energy in our warehouses through small scale hydro, solar, and wind. We purchase renewables for all of our operations across the world. But again, it's not enough. We still emit too much carbon in the movement of scooters around a particular market, and we are committing to being completely carbon neutral in Paris in 2020. We have to be. We have to be able to make our operations a part of the most important, the solution to one of the most, to the most important crisis that we're facing today. So that's principle number two. All right, principle number three, and story number three. I want to rewind the clock back to 2001. So, Ginger was the word on everybody's lips in Silicon Valley. People were saying it. They didn't know why. It was a big hyped word. Nobody knew anything about what Ginger was other than it was going to revolutionize the world. And they knew that this gentleman was involved. Anybody who knows who this is? It's a gentleman named Dean Kamen. He's a famous American inventor, and he's, a, he's really a polymath that has invented many things in different categories from healthcare to, to automotive. The other thing they knew is that this man was behind it. This is John Doerr, one of the most famous venture capitalists in the world, man behind Amazon and Google. And what John was trying to, what John was quoted as saying is, this is, Ginger's going to be bigger than the internet. Way to tamp down expectations. And he was saying that it's going to be the fastest company to reach a billion dollars in sales. Even Steve Jobs was out there saying, this, Ginger is going to be as big a deal as the PC and it's going to transform cities. Well, this was a super hyped uh, item, as you might imagine. This is why all of Silicon Valley was talking about Ginger, but nobody again knew what it was. And then on December 3rd of 2001, on a well-known morning show called Good Morning America, Ginger was revealed to the world. Anybody know what it was before I reveal it? What was that? It's the segue. The segue. It was a technological marvel at the time. It was a self-balancing scooter. And the world reacted with a collective, huh? How is that bigger than the internet? How is that going to transform cities? Nobody could understand. And truthfully, it failed. It completely failed in that objective. And I'd say it failed for several reasons. And the most important of which, it was completely an inaccessible product. And let me talk about what I mean by accessibility. So the first was there were no norms. This sounds familiar in the scooter business. People would ride it on the sidewalk and be told to ride on the street. People would ride it on the street and the police would tell them to ride on the sidewalk. Could you bring it into an office building? Nobody knew how to integrate this device into their daily lives. So that was one. The second was this problem. It had all the social acceptance. In fact, I would argue that the Segway was the Google Glass of its day. A face computer you would not be caught de dead wearing for fear of being immediately labeled as a dork. And it was expensive, $5,000. They claimed to want to transform cities, but the only people that could afford it were the wealthy. They said they were going to do um, something like 10,000 units a week. They sold 30,000 units in six years. And so it became a niche product for the wealthy. Or people like Steve Wozniak, who was the co-founder of Apple, who's both wealthy and has the uh, willingness to be seen uh, playing Segway polo uh, on the device. So ultimately, this thing became a meme for mall cops. And it's faded into the dustbin of history. So what is the lesson? I think the most important lesson is that all of the hype in the world couldn't save the Segway. Not the hype from the world's greatest venture capitalist or the world's most beloved product founder. And the reason is that they claimed to want to serve 
the community and transformed cities, but instead they only served the wealthy. And so the North Star principle for us is we absolutely must make universal access to transportation affordable and serve all the community in cities. This is an incredibly important principle for Lyme. Whether it is a commuter in Paris, a tourist in Boston, or a someone who lives in a what we call a transit desert, a place where public transit doesn't reach them so that they can get to work, affordable transportation is, in my opinion, a right. And so a guiding principle of Lyme is that we have to serve the entirety of our community and our cities because transportation is what affords economic opportunity for all. A sustainable city is not just ecologically sustainable, it's about economic opportunity for all and transportation is directly tied to that. And that's why we're passionate about this. So again, I think business and industry guided by ethical principles can be a force for good from safety to climate change and working on the most important crisis of our time to equal access to transportation for economic equality, these are the things that guide Lyme. Not when it's convenient and not when it's easy, but when it's hard. And that is what motivates us. This is what gives us meaning and purpose. And this is why I believe business and industry, again, can be a foundational force for good and progress. So lastly, I want to close by talking about what I think the biggest threat to micromobility is. It's not competition, it's not alternatives, it's not a patchwork of regulatory environments all over the world. It is simply this. It is inertia. It is the inability to believe and have the imagination that the future can be any different than the past. I love this quote that imagining the future is a form of nostalgia. And the reason that's actually true is when you put people in a functional MRI and you ask them to imagine the future, does anybody know what areas of their brain light up? Memory, exactly, memory. You literally anatomically cannot think about the future without anchoring in your thoughts about the past. This is what makes people imagining a different future, what makes it so difficult for people. And so the enemy of a, our imagining of a different future is us. It's us. And it's our inability to believe that this landscape of traffic and congestion, we collectively can make it that. It's just so hard to believe and we are trapped by our own anatomy. And an inability to believe that that environment can become this. But the good news is, in my opinion, is that we've done the impossible and the unimaginable before. That is what gives me hope. And it's because people like this in this room demand that the future is going to be different. And we, I want Lyme to play its part with a series of ethical principles that makes our cities, and our planet better. So thank you. I appreciate the time and listening.